everyone and welcome. My name is Alexey and I'm from iDext. Today I'm going to talk about supporting complex scripts in PDF products, which turns out to be a bit challenging compared to the landing-based script, for example. In the bottom part of this slide, you can only see a fraction of the manifold of the scripts out there. The ones in dark blue don't require a lot of additional work and are easy to support, which you cannot say about the scripts in orange. The photo on top shows the typographical equipment for one of such complex scripts, Dev and Agri, and that's just a small part of the set. Even though there are 47 characters in the alphabet, the letterpress set usually contains up to 200 pieces because the text shaping is context dependent. So we'll look into what the complexities in supporting such scripts in PDF software are and how to solve them. We'll also explore a couple of mistakes one can make when implementing those algorithms. This is an example in Arabic. To get the correct visual representation like the one in the top instead of the one in the bottom, there is a set of operations one needs to perform. So which scripts are called complex and what is their complexity? The main criteria for calling the script complex are, first, bidirectional text presence, where characters may be written from either right to left or left to right directions. So that's the case for Arabic and Hebrew, for example. The other one is context sensitive shaping, where a character may change its shape depending on its location and the surrounding characters. For example, a single character in a Arabic script can have as many as four different shape forms, depending on the context. The final one is ordering change where the displayed order of the characters is not the same as the logical order. Example is Dev Nagri, even though it's a left to right script. We'll take a look at it a bit later. If we project the previous notion of script complexity on the PDF field, we'll get even more items on the list of extra steps one needs to take to process complex scripts. And those steps are closely tied to one another. Today, we'll talk about many of these items, but more emphasis will be put on applying open time features, Unicode BD algorithm, writing content using correct syntax, and extracting the content back from PDF to Unicode. I hope the terms I mentioned will become clearer towards the end of this presentation for those of you who have never faced them before. Here we overview an example of which transformations a piece of Arabic text undergoes during the process of adding into PDF. The first line is the result as if we added the Arabic text into PDF without any additional actions, just as English. So that's our logical sequence. Second line shows the right-to-left transformation applied to the text, because Arabic is written from right to left. The next line looks very different from the previous one, because it demonstrates Arabic shaping process in action. And the final line shows the result of vowel positioning applied, so you can see that the positions of the critical marks have changed a bit and they don't overlap anymore. Another example, Khmer script. It's a left-to-right script, no right-to-left, what can be easier, you might wonder. Turns out it's even a question, a question what's easier in the end. On top, you can see the initial text without any script-specific processing applied. The second step shows reordering and glyph substitutions applied. You can see that the first two glyphs have been swapped. We don't have any suspicious plus signs anymore, and this part has changed as well. Now we clearly see a legated glyph, so a glyph consisting of several characters. And finally, positioning. Similarly to the Arabic example, you can see that this mark glyph has changed its position a bit. Arabic and Indic script processing share some steps, but also have a lot of differences. In total, probably around 2 billion people in the world are potentially affected by these complex scripts requirements. So let's take a deeper look at one of the necessary pieces in supporting right-to-left script, the Unicode bidirectional reordering algorithm, or simply BD algorithm. What's important to understand, first of all, is that right-to-left scripts are only shown from right-to-left, so the reading direction is affected, but in the logical sequence, for example, start of the word is earlier than end of the word. This means that, for example, if you want to do some kind of string manipulation, like uh, get a prefix of a word, you do it as usual, as you're used to. So the difference is only in how you read the text and display it. The first and foremost step in displaying right to left text is beauty algorithm. Not using beauty algorithm is a mistake number one, but of course you will notice it easily. Let's have a better understanding on why beauty algorithm is needed at all. As we know, in PDF syntax, all the graphical content, including text, is positioned at the strictly defined coordinates. And as a PDF creator, when creating your file, you need to calculate those positions to show the text. But looking at the picture, why not just take the portion of the text that fits into the given line width and show it in reversed order, so that the first glyph of the logical sequence is, is the rightmost glyph? Shouldn't be that difficult, right? Well, it turns out that BD algorithm is there for a reason. If you look at the text in big font size, it, ha it says Hello October PDF 2020 and Hello is written in Hebrew. So overall reading direction is from right to left as indicated by the green line, but the text chunk October PDF 2020 needs to be read from left to right. 
And of course, you don't have those direction changes in the logical sequence. The logical sequence is a continuous sequence with hello October PDFS 720 text. So red arrows represent reading directions of text chunks, and they also correspond to the logical order of the glyphs. Looking at the logical order versus the visual one, it becomes clear that there should be some sort of procedure to get the information about the visual order of the glyphs from the logical sequence. And Unicode bidirectional algorithm is exactly aimed at doing this. So, after we've processed the logical Unicode sequence through the BD algorithm, got the visual order, and uh, showed the text accordingly, is that it? Turns out it's not, because we forgot about text extraction. And as a PD of consumer, um, we must be aware of the correct reading order of the, of the visual glyph sequence. So PDF has reverse cars uh, marked content tag that informs the PDF processor that show strings operations within a marked content sequence contain characters in reverse order. So an important mistake to make is not using reverse cars, and you will not notice it unless you want to consume the PDF. There is another reason for the necessity of BD algorithm, and another important detail in difference between logical order and reading order for right to left scripts, and that's character mirroring. Even though in the logical sequence, the brackets appear as usual, so you can see the opening and the closing brackets here in the Unicode sequence, in visual representation, the brackets are mirrored towards the reading direction. So the closing bracket here acts as an opening bracket because we are reading the text from, from right to left. Mirroring the brackets and other characters is a part of the BD algorithm. So conversion from logical sequence to visual one burns down to using the algorithm just as before, but the mirroring aspect, of course, adds more complexity during text extraction, because we need to tell the PDF consumer that the brackets should be mirrored when extracting. So here's another mistake to make, and that's not telling the PDF reader or processor how to extract the text correctly. So how do, do, do we do that? If we simply um, abuse to Unicode and map closing bracket glyph to the uh, opening bracket character, um, then um, you will have a problem when extracting regular brackets if you're using the font not only in the right-to-left context. So you can create um, a separate font object for just those mirrored brackets and have the mirror to Unicode there, but then what if the user wants to edit your PDF and uh, reuse your fonts? Um, such approach is also difficult if, the, if you are using it in the context of form fields. So there is another way, and that's actual text. Actual text is the mechanism to facilitate processing of PDF content that is visualized in a non-standard way. So this is exactly our case. We have the visual representation different from the logical one. And here is an example of how to use actual text. We have a piece of text that, written, that is written from right to left and the corresponding PDF content stream operators. So we output the content in the left-right order, preserving the correct text positions so that the visual representation is correct. And of course, we use reverse cars. So we have actual text entry in the marked content sequence and we specify the Unicode value that corresponds to the opening bracket for our glyph that looks like a closing bracket. So this has been a bit of theory, but as it often happens, reality is a bit different and everything is not so smooth. Good news is that even if you don't care about reverse cars, many major PDF consumers will still understand the right-to-left context and apply the necessary reversing steps to extract the text correctly. So we'll talk about how we, as PDF consumers, can implement similar behavior a bit later. In fact, if you use reverse cars, many PDF consumers will behave exactly if you didn't use that tag. Some PDF consumers will even perform character mirroring and, and extract the brackets correctly even if you don't use actual text. But the bad news is that the approach with reverse cars and actual text is merely supported, and PDF consumers that work correctly without those declarations can stop working correctly with them. One aspect that we haven't talked about yet is tagging, which is very relevant these days. So um, how do we tag um, content with uh, mixed directions correctly? The answer is in the spec and it's very simple. We just follow the logical order of content in the structure tree and not the visual one. So in the case of uh, this Hello October PDF 2020 example, we might have two spans of text. One for Hebrew word uh, hello and uh, the other one for English text. But Hebrew span comes first, at, as it's uh, first in the, in the logical order. So I've mentioned that many viewers will still be able to extract the logical text from the visual one, even if you don't use reverse cars or actual text. How do they do that? The answer is the inverse BD algorithm. In fact, because PDF is a less structured format to represent your data, this algorithm may be needed in many more cases, and not only if reverse card is missing. 
Simple example of such case is when all of your glyphs are in random order on the canvas and you need to sort them to extract the, the content in the PDF, uh, which is not tagged. After that sorting, of course, we have lost all the information about text reading directions. There is a bit of history behind the inverse BD algorithm. Legacy systems frequently store text in visual order to avoid reordering for, for display. So the algorithm to convert the representation into logical one was developed back then. So this is not something specific to PDF world. There are two problems with an inverse reordering from visual to logical order though. There may be more than one logical order of text that results in the same visual representation. So it's impossible to restore the logical order 100% correctly in general case. And the second problem is that there is no standard algorithm for inverse reordering. In general, all the systems came to the conclusion that data should not be rewarded from logical to visual order unless when you are displaying the, the content and printing it. But PDF format brings complexity here because it already creates print-ready, strictly positioned content. So here is an example of how inverse BD algorithm works. To apply it, we just sort all the glyphs by their position and feed, it, feed them to the algorithm. On top, we can see the visual red sequence of glyphs from 1 to 24, and in the bottom, you can see the logical sequence, which is the result of the inverse BD algorithm. As you can see, the logical order sequence is broken into two subsequences. So here is the first one, and here is the second one. And even though hello is on the right, is the first word, and it's a right to left one, because the very first glyph is the rightmost one. After this hello word, we proceed to read the text in the left to right direction, because we have English text. So we've talked about BD reordering, which was the first step in our transformation pipeline. We've covered not only the aspect of the necessary logical to visual transformation, but also the steps one needs to take for, for PDF to be consumable and extractable. Let's see what else we need to do. So now we are at the shaping step. If latent-based scripts are pretty straightforward and each character has equal visual representation no matter which part of the word it is in, most of the characters in a Arabic script have many, as many as four different visual forms depending on the context. So those forms are called initial, medial, final, and isolated forms. In the table, you can see five characters in the, in the word, one per row, and different visual representations depending on the form in, in four columns. As you can see, the forms differ quite a lot. In the shaped word, you can see that all the glyphs are beautifully glued together now. We have one glyph in initial form. Remember that we are in right to left context, so it's the rightmost glyph. We have three glyphs in medial form and one more glyph in final form. So how do we implement Rebic shaping? One possible implementation is to use open type font features. Open type fonts organize the related information in tables. One of such tables, gsub, which means glyph substitution, contains several features with information about which glyph should be substituted by which one in scope of that particular feature. Among those features are features responsible for transforming glyphs into initial, medial, and final forms in Arabic scripts. Those glyph mappings in features can be complex, and they are not necessarily one-to-one -one mappings, as in our case of single glyph shaping in Arabic. One example of the many-to-one -one mapping is the RLIG feature, which stands for required ligatures. Here is an example of our link feature in action. Without that feature, you would get the output on the right, and with it, you would get the output on the left. So the result is different. So we've talked about font implementation of Arabic shaping, which is based on open type font features, but there is another way. Some operations can be done purely on Unicode level, and Arabic shaping is exactly this case. This is the case when the Arabic glyph forms fit into the Unicode, and having info in the font or in the Unicode is more or less interchangeable. There is a drawback, of course. It requires a lot of um, Unicode space for storing all that information. So for each of the glyph forms, we need a Unicode character. And uh, in total, we need at least four times more code space than we could have. But Arabic Unicode space is even richer. And there are around 1500 code points in total. As a result, we have the Unicode characters for a medial form of an Arabic letter, a character for a ligature consisting of four characters, and even a character for a complete phrase. If substitutions are possible at the Unicode level, why bother adding that information to the fonts? After all, adding shaping features into every single font probably creates quite some burden on font creators. In fact, we don't have uh, so much space in Unicode, even though it's theoretically unlimited. If the features were applied at the Unicode level and uh, all the rules were described in there, Unicode would be overcrowded by all those combinations. For example, we have almost 1500 Unicode characters reserved for Arabic, but the Avnagri script has many more potential substitutions. 
Remember that there are more complex ones than just replacing one glyph with another one, as we do in a rabbit shaping. So we have to rely on fonts here. Even though some of them uh, may not have necessary information, and uh, well, sometimes we still have to fall back to Unicode level transformations. Creating good quality PDFs with the complex script is much harder than just using standard text showing operators, passing the corresponding glyphs as arguments, and getting the result. While correct visual representation can be just guaranteed by right glyphs being shown, the PDF will only be consumable if we make sure that we can map those glyphs correctly back to Unicode. For simple cases of Arabic shaping, we can use to Unicode mapping, which maps glyphs IDs to the corresponding Unicode values. However, for Devnagari, for example, transformations are more complex, and it's not always possible to map them back to Unicode with simple means of to Unicode mapping. We'll see an example in a moment where it's even not possible to map a single glyph to Unicode values correctly, and thus, in the world of complex scripts, we often need to use the notion of syllable or cluster as the minimal set of glyphs for which we can guarantee correct mapping back to Unicode. So here is an example of the effect of rewardering, which takes place before applying the font features. You can see the original Unicode sequence, the individual glyph representations of those Unicode characters, and the resultant shaped word consisting of three parts in different colors. Indic rewardering is a bit of out of scope of my talk today, so we can just assume that some characters randomly jump inside of the word before being shown. We see that um, there is a very clear mapping um, for two glyphs um, to their Unicode values in the, in the original string, but then we only have one part left in our shaped word and two Unicode subsequences. So it's absolutely unclear how to map the glyphs to Unicode representation with a standard to Unicode mechanism that only allows you to map a glyph to a continuous sequence of one or more Unicode characters. We could cheat and uh, add fake mappings from, from glyphs to Unicode characters and maybe map this first uh, blue glyph to, to three Unicode characters instead of one. And uh, that would maybe produce correct results for this word as a whole, but not for individual glyphs. And it's also uh, will, not, will work only if you use uh, those glyphs in, in this context, but uh, if, if you use these glyphs in, in other contexts, in other words, the result may be incorrect. So that's not the right way. Remember the definition of the actual text, which mentioned that it can be specified for non-standard content representations. Turns out, in many cases, it has to be specified. And this is another mistake in supporting complex scripts that you will not notice unless you want to consume the file. You should use the minimal possible sequence in the actual text block to allow copying small chunks of the text. And uh, here is an example. We have uh, two glyphs and we map them together at once to five Unicode characters. Uh, it's not possible to map a single glyph to Unicode as we've seen, so this minimal um, possible sequence consists of two glyphs here. Previously we briefly talked about actual text support in the context of mixed text directions, but in the context of uh, index script shaping the scenario is a bit different, but actually the practical result is similar. Actual text is unfortunately not supported in many PDF viewers and the ones that support it have some problems with extraction of decritical marks and determining spaces between words. We have talked about the second step in our transformation pipeline. We have covered not only the aspect of the necessary logical to visual transformation, but also the steps one needs to take for PDF to be consumable and extractable. Let's see what else we need to do for our final step. The final stage is adjusting the visual positions of the glyphs. There is another table in OpenType called GPOS which stands for glyphs, uh, glyph positioning. And uh, this table is responsible for finalizing the visual representation of our text. It contains simpler instructions like decreasing or uh, increasing distances between neighboring glyphs, so-called X advance and uh, Y advance, uh, as well as more complex instructions for glyph attachments. Here we should be familiar with the notion of the, of the base glyph. So that's the regular glyph uh, that resides on the baseline and the diacritical glyph or the mark glyph. Mark glyphs typically have width equal to zero in the fonts to prevent the, the carrot offset. Still, depending on the base glyph, it's required to attach marks into different positions. To define attachment instructions, a new notion of anchors is introduced. Anchors are defined as, uh, for, for glyphs as uh, positions within those glyphs, which should match when we attach one glyph to another. So you can see that the anchors are marked with stars in the picture, 
and the initial decritical glyph position shifts to the left a bit and a bit to the bottom so that the anchors of the mark and the base glyph match. Of course, there is always a trick with complex script support and there is one for the anchors as well. If the glyph is a ligature, or in other words, a composition of several glyphs, it can easily define several anchors. So we need to track which base glyph the mark is tied to and find the corresponding anchor related to that base glyph in our ligature. So here we have two glyphs that have been shaped into a ligature and now there are two anchors. And depending on which base glyph we attach our mark to, the result is very different. So this is a more or less simple example, but a ligature can consist of three or even more components and there could be even several marks that we need to attach in correct places. And in those complex cases, actual text plays a truly vital role in extracting the text correctly, especially if the mark is attached to a component somewhere in the middle of the ligature. It's a common practice to perform some glyph sorting uh, as a part of text extraction pipeline because the glyphs can be in random order in the content stream. However, positioning of the marks might change the, the original relative order of the base glyph uh, and, and marks after that sorting. For example, the mark that was uh, to the right of base glyph in the original logical sequence might have been placed a bit to the left to make the visual representation correct. And if you blindly sort glyphs by position, the mark will be on the left of the base glyph rather than on the right, giving the incorrect result. Remember that marks often have zero widths, so sorting is very sensitive to small position changes. So our sorting algorithms also need to be adjusted to take that into account if we want to consume PDFs with complex scripts correctly. Typically, text shaping algorithms, Unicode bidirectional reordering and related algorithms are not needed for developing software that supports complex scripts because those things are done under the hood by your operating system. But if you develop PDF software, then you need to be well aware of these challenges because it becomes your responsibility. This is a side effect of the PDF being a format representing precise drawing instructions rather than well-structured data, although PDF of course can be structured as well. In PDF world, all the pieces of the puzzle must fall together for a complex script to be supported. It's not only about a creator or a consumer, it's about both of them. And for each of them, it's not only about doing one or a couple of steps, but about doing all of them. Not supporting complex scripts in products we make creates interoperability problems, and it might slow down adoption of PDF as the universal document interchange format in countries natively using complex scripts. And interoperability is a challenge even for the products that support complex scripts, as we've seen. So here is some further reading. I invite you to take a look at the presentation from PDF Days 2016, where a bit more in-depth explanation is given on the role of actual text in complex script support, and uh, in general, the mechanism of applying font features also discussed a bit more, more thoroughly. Now I would like to speak about the solutions offered by iTech Software. So who we are? We are a leading PDF technology company and we are a board member of PDF Association. Our open source SDK is available for 20 years now and we are celebrating 20 years of code in 2020. So I invite you to find us on social media and uh, learn more about it. We have more than 125 million users worldwide and more than 7,000 clients. Our flagship product is iDEX 7. It's a well-proven SDK technology with iDEX 7 core serving as a foundation around which we build a series of add-ons from rendering, reduction, optical character recognition and uh, conversion HTML and XFA to PDF to data extraction and of course complex script support, which also comes as an add-on. But we also have a load code technology offering for document generation, iDEX Dito. iDEX Dito simplifies the process of creating and maintaining data-driven forms and templates. It has a visual template designer and a powerful SDK for processing, which is available in Java, Docker, and CLI. I'm going to walk you through iDEX products from low level to higher levels, and of course the main focus will be made in support of complex scripts. Obviously, you don't want to write low level PDF syntax operations as in the screenshot, even though iDEX allows that as well. So we'll start with a bit of high level code. By the way, uh, on the screenshot is an iDEX tool as well, which is called iDEX RUPS which stands for Reading and Updating PDF Syntax. It's um, open source and available for download. Let's first take a look at how um, to create a PDF document with iDEX Core for, for simple scripts. So here we write code in Java, but iDEX is available both for Java and .NET platform. Uh, we start by creating a PDF document and immediately proceed with creating a document wrapper around it, which brings us to another high layout level, which allows you to, uh, to add elements like paragraphs, um, tables, and, and so on immediately. 
So we add a paragraph uh, in a table with uh, some good evening greetings in a couple of languages. And we also apply some minor styling like uh, central alignment or background colors for, for cells. And here is how the result looks like. With under 10 lines of code, um, we've been able to generate a PDF document with uh, some content already. Now to add support for complex scripts, all we need to do is provide fonts. Here we define a font provider and just add font files into int by providing paths to your font files in the system. As an alternative, you can just add all your system fonts at once if you don't want to provide individual paths explicitly. After you have created a font provider, all you need to do is attach it to your document instance. And here, complex script support works out of the box. In fact, PDF Calligraph is an ITX7 add-on which seamlessly integrates in the code, and as a user of ITX, you don't need to do anything else. Now let's move to a bit higher level. For those who don't feel like writing ITX code to add layout objects into the document, you can simply create an HTML document and convert it to PDF. Of course, your HTML model might already be coming from another system like CRM, IRP, and so on, as a report, for example. PDF HTML has a rich support for HTML tags and CSS properties. In this case, we've created an HTML file with uh, some styling and added chocolate words in, in several languages. Conversion from HTML to PDF is a one-liner now, and the complex scripts are also supported out of, out of the box, so you don't even have to provide fonts. Here in the screenshot, you can see the resultant PDF file, which looks just like the original HTML form. What about text extraction? Let's suppose we've got the PDF that we generated on the previous step with PDF HTML and we want to extract data from it. We have PDF to data add-on serving that purpose. So PDF to data is a semi-automatic data extraction tool. It means it still needs some human input to define the data we're looking for, but once the template for searching data is defined, PDF to data will do all the magic automatically for other similar files. To describe the data we are looking for, and we call those descriptions data fields, PDF to data has a visual editor where you can add those data fields and populate it with the selectors, creating flexible data search and filtration pipelines. In this case, I've created a data field, uh, which is called items, with a single table selector. And all I had to do was to provide the headers of the table I'm looking for. You can run the data extraction for your template right in the editor and see that the table is extracted completely and it's marked with the yellow. After you've defined your data fields, you can just export your template and run it against other similar PDF files you might have, getting the structured data out of them. So this is a screenshot from pdf to data web tool, which shows the extracted data from our sample PDF. As you can see, all the data in different scripts is extracted correctly. So all the actual text declarations in PDF syntax are also supported, and this is what gives us the desired output. For those of you who want to generate PDFs with as little code as possible, have immediate what you see is what you get feedback, and easily connect your visual templates to various data sources, we have released low-code ITEX D2 solution. Its first component is template designer application, which allows you to create templates in a visual way and define connections to your data as well as preview the resultant PDF immediately. And the second component is ITEX D2 SDK, which allows you to mass produce the PDFs through your data batches. ITEX D2 SDK is available for Java platforms but we also have the Docker version, which allows you to use the SDK from any programming language using REST API. The aim of the designer application is to simplify the user experience as much as possible, from defining the styles of the elements to defining the connections to data with a single click. On the screenshot, you can see the tree-like visual representation of the template data, and to define a connection to the data, you can just click on the data node, and the data bind expression will be generated for you. Generating PDFs from the templates you created in the designer application is a tuner liner as well. Just fetch the right data and fit it to the generation API along with the template, and you get your PDF. And of course, complex scripts are also supported out of the box. The Docker API allows you to use ITEX Diesel from almost any environment you want with the REST API and easily scale your applications. On the screenshot, you can see an example of an HTTP request to the Docker SDK. We support all the additional configurations you might want to provide, such as generating PDF 2.0 files. So IDEX offers you a wide product line for most of the PDF workflows you can imagine. And you can select the level you want to dive in, from very low code to full control over the result. I know that everyone loves playing around with demos, so I'm leaving a couple of links here. 
First of all, uh, a demo for a couple of ITX core platform functionalities, from converting images to PDFs to merging and splitting your PDFs and protecting them with a password. This functionality is available right on our website, and you can use it. Um, I, and you can use it either as a fully functional application or play around with ITX core with ITX code in the, in the sandbox right next to the app. Then we have a separate demo for PDF to data where you can play around with data extractions for your own templates and try PDF to data in practice. Alternatively, you may start with the existing samples or go through the onboarding experience just to make yourself comfortable with the tool. And finally, our demo for IDEX D2. We've prepared a couple of getting started samples that allow you to easily try the tool out or use them as basis for your own templates. There is an onboarding mechanism included as well, which can help you to get familiar with all the parts of the designer application. You would have to fill out a form to access that one, but don't be afraid, you will get the link right away after that. So that was it. Uh, thank you for staying till the end. And in case you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach to me directly via email, or we should also have a short Q&A session right now. Yep. Uh, well, thank you so much, Alexei. That was great. We're now going to start taking some questions um, uh, and encourage you to go ahead and, and, and put your questions for Alexei into the question pod so that he can get them. And uh, I know one question that I'm curious about, Alexei, is that from, from your presentation is, if, if my central interest as a developer is Latin scripts, um, are these complexities that you've been discussing, are these, uh, imp are these things important for me to know as well? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I would really encourage everyone to, to think about complex scripts when you're developing your PDF products because um, I think it's pretty, pretty likely that you have some kind of a user interaction in your, uh, in your product and um, you just don't know which, which input you would get from, from the users. And, um, they might just uh, ask you to generate a PDF with uh, with uh, some content, which is a complex script. Um, so really, my my big encouragement here is is to think about them. Uh, but of course, uh, well, answering it very practically, you probably don't need any kind of bidirectional reordering here because um, latent scripts are just left to right. Uh, you don't have any right to left there. Uh, but uh, some things are relevant here. Uh, so first of all, sorting. Um, the the Latin scripts still have diacritical marks uh, in them, like like in German language, for instance. And still, when you sort your your glyphs in your content streams, you have to be very careful to, to really take those uh, into account. And then uh, we have to take care about the the um, the attachments of, uh, of marks to, to the base characters, so the, the um, visual positioning uh, things that I mentioned, because uh, many fonts still have ligatures for, uh, so, so to, to kind of indicate a better visual representation for um, two connected uh, glyphs, like uh, in Latin scripts, you often have a ligature for a double F um, character. And then if you have ligatures and, and you have marks in the same uh, word, that then you have to take care about uh, how to correctly attach those uh, marks, those critical symbols to, to your base glyphs. And um, uh, that's why you have to use fonts. And uh, that's uh, what you need to pay additional attention when extracting uh, such content. Um, when we're talking about um, actual text, I think, um, you probably don't need that much. Uh, maybe one case I can think of when you when you do need it is um, very sophisticated typographical uh, features. Uh, so if your font is is really fancy one and uh, it has some um, substitution lookups and um, uh, well there are a lot of uh, terms for for that. For instance, one is one is swashes, so uh, your your glyph can have additional uh, additional swashes uh, into it to kind of make it very, very fancy. Uh, so in those cases, there can potentially be a substitution that really changes the order of, uh, of your glyphs. So the visual order will be different from the logical one. And in that case, you do have to um, use actual text to really make sure your text is extracted correctly. Uh, but I think in more plain cases, the kind of main thing to um, consider is, is the critical marks and uh, well, 
uh, extracting them correctly and placing them correctly uh, with uh, with ligatures if you have.